Hi, everyone. I uh, just want to let you know we are shifting over to um, our Q&A, and I've got, I'll be getting uh, Andy on and uh, Ben Woodbury from the Friends of History here shortly. So, Andy, we do have a, a question from the chat, which is, uh, Santa Fe River would normally flow to the Rio Grande at Cochiti. Uh, the city is planning on building a pipeline to pipe treated water back to the Rio Grande at Buckman. Uh, why isn't it being diverted back to the Rio Grande at Cochiti? Um, so there's, I hope you can hear me okay, yes. So the main reason for that is that um, the water that comes right out of the wastewater treatment plant um, is deemed to be owned by the city because they treated it and processed it and that sort of thing. And so the shortest route is for them um, to pipe it back up to the, the um, place from which they draw the water for the Buckman direct diversion. That's part of the San Juan Chama water. And if they do that right to that site, they get, uh, I'm going to say 100% return flow credits, which allows them to draw more of their um, allotment from the San Juan Chama water. If they, if they put that water back in downstream, um, anywhere downstream below where they're taking it out, they have to discount how much they, they get for return flow credits. So if they put it in, let's, I'm gonna say down by, um, you know, Cochiti Pueblo, let's say they get, um, you know, 90% return flow credits versus 100% if they put it in back up at the, right by the Buckman direct diversion from which they take it out. And it's the same thing that happens when people have bought water rights down by Socorro, which the city of Santa Fe has, uh, and move those up river, then that water is discounted, which kind of makes sense because of course uh, it's, it's uh, water that's, it's traveled the uh, roughly 70 miles on down river. And so it was more than that, excuse me, over like a hundred miles. So um, some of that water that they're putting back in is lost, if you will. The other reason that the city has given for putting it back in up by the Buckman direct diversion is that pipeline uh, goes right by the Buckman water treatment plant. And so potentially in the future, this water could be um, treated the additional amount, I think they call it tertiary treatment, that would make it um, totally recyclable uh, and close the loop, if you will. Hmm. How would you gauge the, the health of the watershed uh, in relation to recent history, um, mm -hmm. longer history? Uh, are we on an up, up, up cycle, uh, you know, an, uh, a yeah. positive trend? I get what you mean. And, and I can, we can do it too. And in, in over that long term, if you will, 400 years ago, uh, before there was uh, uh, Spanish uh, settlements in the area, uh, the river was a bit different, of course, than it is today. And so it went from um, probably flowing most of the year, depending, of course, on snow and normal meteorological and climate changes. Um, and then, of course, when they started putting the reservoirs in up, upstream, and the first one was the uh, Old Stone Dam, 1885, I believe, um, then all of a sudden the, the river flows stopped uh, flowing because they were diverting it to pipes um, into houses. So what happens there, it's a, it's a, uh, the water uh, is not recharged in the, in the aquifers and the water tables. And so you have a, basically a desertification, desertification. I always get the pronunciation wrong in those, but anyway, with the dropping water table. And that probably reached its peak right after World War II, uh, when we were really, um, uh, losing our water table, it was going south. A lot of that was the advent of electric uh, pumps, so people could really get into their wells and, and pull the water out in, in large quantities, fairly cheaply. So that I'm going to say put that about the 50s or 60s, and then we realized we had some issues going on with doing that. 
And so they started um, basically the reservoirs, utilizing the reservoirs um, uh, in conjunction with the aquifer and of course planning and eventually building uh, the Buckman direct diversion, supplementing our water. So since they they brought on the Buckman direct diversion with San Juan Chama water, they have been able to rest the wells, uh, both our city wells and the Buckman wells on the road to Buckman. Um, and so the water tables, aquifer, the water level in the aquifers has risen and it's come back to the point where down by the Buckman wells, they've actually had artesian flows, water flowing naturally out. Now we, we don't have that in Santa Fe. It'd be kind of fun if we did. The, the old Bishop's Bass Pond by the cathedral uh, would be a pond again because there were springs there. But generally our, our, with our aquifer levels rising, the health of our watershed uh, is improving. And you were seeing that with vegetation in the riparian zones. So there's kind of some neat things there. The Living River Ordinance of 2012 that the city of Santa Fe did um, went a long way toward um, uh, uh, getting more water in the river up to a thousand acre feet um, and, uh, uh, and helping that aquifer out, bringing that up also. So there have been some neat things we're, we're working on. Would you... Uh kind of got into answering our next next question from Francois Marie uh, Petorni, which was uh, what, <laughs> what are the prospects of more water in in the river given the expected recurring droughts recurrent droughts yeah so this is our challenge um, we should uh, should point out that Francois Marie used to be on our board um, for many years and was president of the board and has been involved in water issues in, in Santa Fe for years um, and is, is an expert on that. So um, generally with our, with reduced uh, precipitation um, or precipitation at different timings, like less snowpack and more uh, monsoonal type of events, um, what it means is our surface water is going to become less dependable. And that is going to leave us with a situation where we, we hope to have our aquifers fully charged, if you will, ready, because of the challenge of, um, of, of our surface water becoming um, not there. And so uh, our aquifers are going to be our insurance policy. What would a what would the watershed look like without flowing river? I guess in parts it exists that way uh, mm -hmm. now because of the dams. So, um, what if we look to the future to a point where um, stretches of of the river is aren't flowing freely? What what becomes of a what comes becomes the mission for the watershed? Do you think at that point it's kind of maybe more of a philosophical um, doomsday <laughs> uh, kind of thing? But it, uh, at some point, the history we've known has has changed quite yeah. significantly. Yeah. So what? Um, it's kind of I'll put it in a kind of a funny expression, but what we're hanging our hat on is is uh, aquifer storage recharge. And these are simple things like rain gardens, which capture stormwater. We all know that when we have a monsoonal event, uh, a big rainstorm, uh, the vast majority of the water is shooting on down away from us and is lost to our watershed, Rio Grande and on down to Texas and um, on through there. So anyway, what we're trying to do is is use stormwater as a resource. It's all one water is the concept. And so therefore we can um, uh, capture the water here and recharge our aquifer here. And uh, therefore we're able to um, have these reserves. And we're talking about potentially a lot of water. Our watershed's about 254,000 acres. We get on average about one foot, 12 inches of water per year on that 
on that 254,000 acres. So we have therefore about 254,000 acre feet of water that falls on our watershed. Our water usage is only 10,000 acre feet. 10,000 is a lot of, and, and to give you an idea, an acre foot's about 326,000 gallons. So the idea is, is what we want to try and do though is, is capture as much of the water that falls in our watershed and keep it here. And the best place we see to store it is in our aquifers. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty cool. I mean, imagine, and, and this is going on, we're, we're building rain gardens all the time. We just yesterday got noticed that uh, the state river stewards program is granting us some money to build a rain garden right by Old Santa Fe Trail and um, Alameda Street. So that'll be going in in the next two years now. So we can do these everywhere. There is a question. Uh, do you need funding for the rain gardens or are there other ways that people can get involved? Yes, we do need, we're always looking for funding. So to give you an idea um, with our rain gardens, uh, we've been part of uh, uh, a group and the, um, of building a series of rain gardens in the student parking lot of Santa Fe High. And this, this is a huge project and, and the um, Lisa Randall at the um, Santa Fe Public Schools uh, and Aaron Coffin of the Southwest Urban Hydrology has brought us in. And what we were able to do is build, I call them parking lot rain gardens, uh, almost like pocket rain gardens. Each one has a tree in it because they're engineered and designed to capture enough water to support a tree without irrigation. And it's also infiltrating water back into, um, into the aquifer. These small rain gardens are as little as about $4,000 a piece. And of course they go out more and it depends on size and the engineering that has to happen with them. You don't just scoop out a parking lot. You have to plan on how to capture that water, infiltrate it back and then vegetation. So those are what we've been we've been working on. Uh, in in terms of uh, uh, you know William Henry's talk about Agua Fria, I'm wondering about the the role and the relationship of the various communities, uh, both to the watershed and the association and the work that you do. Um, gotcha. What's that look like? Yeah. So uh, we were involved initially with the with the founding of a group called the Santa Fe River Traditional Communities Collaborative. Um, I shouldn't say we were involved with the founding, but we for, were for sure one of the founding members. Um, and what this is, is uh, an informal gathering of residents and um, governmental uh, agencies that are involved in the areas from Agua Fria down to La Cienaguilla and La Cienega and La Bajada and El Cañón. And it's basically gathering once every now two months to try to uh, see what's going on and to try and identify the issues um, that they have done there because they're a lot different than the issues that we have in the city um, with our watershed and of course with the municipal watershed and the upper watershed. And so that's a very important part. You can actually go on our, on our website, um, santafewatershed.org and look at the Living River, Living Watershed Project and go down to the lower watershed and see, um, we actually have the meetings on there, and papers and different things that have been done. There's so much discussion on that lower watershed area, um, frankly, because they've kind of been left out um, over, the, over the last century. And so everybody realizes, yeah, they have a, they've been there and they have a, a right to be there. And mm -hmm. so we're working with them. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everyone that's still online. I uh, thanks for being flexible uh, in terms of the technical issues. We also we continue to try to sort those out as we uh, adapt ourselves to this new normal. Having said that, I want to thank Andy for uh, uh, car carrying the Q and A. It complements very well uh, everything that William Me uh, was able to share with us in terms of the broader history. It gave us a better understanding in terms of some of the issues um, that uh, the Watershed Association um, is, is advocating and supporting to, to best improve uh, our water condition here uh, in and around the uh, Santa Fe River. I do want to mention to 
to those that um, uh, are still on um, that uh, both uh, the uh, original uh, Williams talk is st is now uh, online on the New Mexico History Museum Facebook page and uh, will be there for some time. In addition, William had asked that uh, his uh, the slides for his presentation be posted separately. It will include the references and also give people time to uh, review the, you know, those many fascinating uh, historical uh, photos that he's been able to collect on the period. So uh, again, thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, William up there in the ether. And uh, we uh, uh, look forward to seeing everyone again uh, in August. Uh, and uh, we, just so that you know, the speaker for that period will be uh, William Babcock, who is an associate professor at the University of Texas for, te uh, for, for Dallas. And yeah, he'll be speaking on blurred borders, Apache acculturation and adaptation during the last decades of Spanish rule. We'll of course be sending out announcements uh, on that. And again, we will have this online. Uh, thank you again. I hope you enjoyed the day. And uh, I certainly found it informative as I'm sure many of you did as well. Thank you.